Okay, is that visible to people? Thumbs up? Yep, perfect. Right, yep, okay, excellent. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, Will. Um, and as first speaker, um, I will say, yeah, very big thank you to to Will and Lot and anybody else for, for setting this up. It's great to see so many people um, uh, here. I'm looking forward to this. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm going for uh, a, an award for the most co-authors on a, a, a talk here, um, but fully justified, of course. Um, because this, this talk is kind of a, a quite high level overview, uh, kind of a trunk of a tree, I guess, where it's kind of branching off to, to uh, other people's presentations and, and recent, recent papers and so on. Um, but there is a kind of tight theme, which is integrating paleomagnetic data with, with numerical dynamo simulations. And that's central to, to what we're trying to do um, in Liverpool and was the topic of um, a workshop we had about a year and a half ago before all this COVID nonsense started. Um, uh, in Wales, so that's where this photo is from um, here. Okay, so this is a very broad um, introduction. So when paleomagnetists, and this will be a talk primarily for paleomagnetists, um, when we talk about models, uh, more often than not, we're referring to, to field models based on spherical harmonic descriptions um, uh, of the real field uh, to some degree. Um, so these can be time varying, like these ones, uh, this one over here, because this is GGF 100K, so the longest time varying model um, that we have, 100, last 100,000 years, um, or they can be statistical. Um, so uh, no real times, every draw from the model is a single instant snapshot uh, in time. And here we're not looking for, for time series then, we're looking at um, mean values, so the paleomagnetic pole latitude shown up here, here at the top, um, and uh, the shapes of distributions in, in this case for virtual geomagnetic uh, poles sampled at different uh, latitudes. Uh, now both these models, um, and more generally why models are so useful, is, is um, that they give global coverage, okay? So they will, they're, they're designed to match um, uh, paleomagnetic data from, from specific places um, but the idea is they fill in the gaps everywhere else on the surface of the Earth. So you can go anywhere and ask what the field was doing. Um, uh, but something that, that is highly pertinent to, to these sorts of models is that they're not physics based. So that's not to say that they're unphysical. Uh, physics uh, creeps in there from, from the rules that are associated with the, the, how the spherical harmonics uh, relate uh, to each other and, and uh, the power spectrum. Um, but that comes in from, from observations of the recent field, not from any um, uh, physical uh, processes. Um, but, you know, the first order of the physics of what's producing the magnetic field um, is, uh, you know, uh, fairly well understood. Um, so it's in dynamo theory. So essentially, um, we have a, um, a rapidly rotating spherical shell, um, the outer core filled with um, conductive fluid uh, that is uh, convecting. And uh, there's a dynamo process going on that's generating, um, as it passes through the existing magnetic field, generating more magnetic field. So this is more or less the entirety of the, the equations that you have to solve. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go through them, but just point out that um, in workstations or supercomputers, you can simultaneously solve uh, these equations and, and time step through the dynamo process, uh, producing as a result an output that is um, uh, magnetic field um, uh, as viewed at the surface, which is what, of course, as paleomagnetists were interested in. Um, now, any model has um, uh, input parameters. So these are kind of the tuning knobs, I guess, for, um, for what you, you twiddle to get the model to behave uh, in a different way. And um, the primary ones for dynamo models are um, these dimension, four dimensionless uh, numbers here. Uh, I'll only mention two of them briefly, one of them the Ekman number. So this is the ratio of, of um, viscous to Coriolis um, forces. And this is extremely small uh, in the earth, like 10 to the minus 16. Um, in the models, we can't get down to that such low values uh, where um, 11 or 12 orders of magnitude uh, um, higher than this. So that means we are ramping up the viscosity. And the reason for this is that that suppresses all the small scale um, uh, turbulence, which we couldn't hope to simulate even in our, our fastest uh, supercomputers. Uh, the other one I'll mention is the Rayleigh number. So hopefully many of you are familiar with this already, that describes the, um, 
we defined the, the, the bigger of the, um, uh, the convection. Um, in the system, this we have to ramp up artificially high to overcome this, um, this enhanced viscosity. Um, now, so that means that we're not in the earth light regime in these, um, but there is a whole wealth of, of literature out there. And, and to kind of sum up, I guess, the state of the art as I understand it, uh, we're more or less in a place now where the force balance um, is arguably the same as in the earth. Uh, and so for all extents and purposes that we're interested in the results, large scale features of the field emerging at the, the surface, um, uh, yeah, it's arguably realistic. We are uh, we are generating a, a, an Earth-like process. Okay, so here's some some models here shown on the left. Here we've got a fairly recent one by Julian Aubert and co-authors. A high-resolution model. We're showing the um, velocity of the flow uh, in the core here, and you can, might be able to make out that there's different flow structures inside and outside this inner core tangent cylinder. So that's aligned. Uh, around the inner core uh, in the direction of the rotation um, axis. And here we've got some, some outputs, and uh, this is from paper from Lulier in 2013. And we've got a nice time series here where uh, we've got a reversal shown in there, a few things that kind of look a bit like small excursions, and we've got the dipole moment going uh, up and down in, in you know, what could look like a, a plausible manner. Um, so dynamo models produce time varying outputs uh, these time series, but we, of course, these, well, apart from some things that Julian has done on the very recent field of, um, and, and others have worked on data assimilation, where we try to mimic the, the very recent field, uh, with that exception, um, other time series that you'll see from Dynamo models, all the ones that we're using, they're not trying to replicate any particular point in history of, um, uh, of the Earth's magnetic field. So you, you treat these time simulations as a dynamo is the outputs of a dynamo process, not the geodynamo. Uh, and you look at them in a, in a statistical sense. Um, but similar to the field models, they give uh, global coverage. And now at least, you know, they're, they're, they are based in, in the physics rather than just being, you know, geometrical descriptions of the field. OK, so we tend to use, um, as paleomagnetists, you know, we, we do use field models, particularly uh, archaeomagnetists use time varying field models uh, a lot, and uh, paleomagnetists use statistical field models a lot. So, to test whether there are directions of average secular variation, for example, um, and to correct for inclination, uh, showing using the EI technique based on the uh, TKO3 model. Um, but we don't tend to use dynamo models. Okay, and, and we're looking to, to try and maybe change that because uh, there's some good reasons why we should be using uh, dynamo models. So, as I've said, you know, the outputs that are physics-based, dynamically self-consistent. Uh, we have the potential for extremely long time series. So time varying models, you know, get to 100,000 years at the most. You know, here we can produce things that are, that are tens, hundreds of millions of years um, uh, long. And um, I guess the, the big sell for dynamo models is that because it's related to the physics of, of, of the, the core and the, the deep earth, we have the potential to recover information then about what saying what our results mean, uh, not only for the field, uh, but also for, um, for outer core dynamics and, and mantle forcing and core evolution and so on. Um, but there are some, uh, some negatives as well that we have to bear in mind with dynamo models. First is that these, they're all dimensionless essentially so that's fine for directions and directions that's all that's all okay um, but for intensities and for time um, these need to be scaled so the models need to be calibrated and there are some uncertainties associated with that with that calibration um, they're very computationally expensive to run um, that said what what you emerge that we're mostly interested in is time series of gauss coefficients it's exactly the same as you'd have from a time varying model so you can then uh, play around with the outputs of them in the same way as you would with a time varying model you don't need to run them uh, actually once uh, and then this final point that i think gets to the nub of, of why we don't use them more is that yeah paleomagnetist dynamo modelers you know just don't talk to each other um very much so there's some notable exceptions in the past so um mcfadden McElhinney, and, and merrill um did some good work great work in the 90s and um uh, rob Coe and gary glatzmeyer they've uh, done some work in the uh, in, in the noughties more recently um but other than that generally there's been a there's been a gap between um, uh, these two communities that, that we're trying to trying to bridge, because there's some some really good reasons to do that. Because um, uh, over here we've got 
paleomagnetic measurements, so clearly observations of, of the real world, but they have the problems that um, they're uh, spatio-temporally restricted uh, in, in where the data can come from, and we've got the um, uh, uh, error and bias associated with, with the measurement processes themselves and the recording processes. And over here, geodynamo model outputs. So, yeah, the, the you know, predictions from a, a simulated um, geodynamo process, uh, they give, you know, perfect coverage. So complete global and get them, we tend to use ones with a time step of around uh, 65 years. So that's, that's a pretty high resolution, temporal resolution. Um, but of course we require constraints and observations. So how can um, these two areas help each other? Well, I've kind of noted that down as, as a series of research questions that are gonna be covered in the rest of this talk. Um, so we have, um, uh, we can ask how realistic these uh, models are and what input parameters uh, best produce this realism. And going the other way, what can the, how can the models help um, our measurements? Uh, they can tell us about the ancient Earth's um, the magnetic field, give us more information than just our measurements do and about the, uh, the, the source of that as well. Okay, so um, First question, how realistic are the models? So when we first came to this, we thought this, you know, we're not the first to think about this and we thought this problem was solved um, because there are already criteria out there. Um, uh, so notably uh, Christensen's criteria from 2010. And he said, well, there's a whole bunch of models and they are Earth-like and they're all good. But then we looked at them, details started comparing them to paleomagnetic data sets rather than just stuff from the, the recent field. And we found that there's a whole host of problems, which, um, I've kind of listed here and I'll give you some examples down here from one of the early models we looked at. So this one, you know, it reverses, um, great. Um, this inclination anomaly is huge, you know, 16 degrees inclination anomaly. So that would be a real problem for uh, plate tectonic reconstructions. There's no evidence to support that at least in the last 10 million years or so. And the other big problem we found was the paleosecular variation was often very unearth-like. So we'd expect BGP dispersion, angular dispersion to be about 11 degrees or something. That's what we see for the last 10 million years. And here it's up in the, you know, in the mid twenties or something at low latitude and increasing with latitude as we do see. So we had this whole bunch of problems uh, with all our simulations. So we built up 46 and we wanted some way to say, okay, which ones are more accurate than the others and how are they um, inaccurate? Uh, so this was work by, um, by Courtney Sprain. Um, she published this paper in 2009 on the QPM criteria. So a set of five criteria, I'm not gonna go through them all. Um, uh, just to say, you can see from this bar chart over here um, that we've got a lot of big red columns. So uh, most of the models failed most of the criteria. Uh, so you can have a maximum QPM score of five if you meet them all five, but we don't even go up to that on the scale because none of them went above, above three. Okay, and the other uh, question is this, is this misfit. So this is based on the normalization uh, of the, um, the discrepancy in uh, the simulated and the reference values, but also taking into account the uncertainties as well. And what we found uh, for these um, is that we never got below this magic number of five, which means that we yeah, five is, is a good number because that means on average, then all of our criteria are within um, errors uh, of one another. Uh, so we scratched our heads a little bit and um, went to work on this and Domenico Midori uh, at Liverpool uh, did some great work on this. And the first thing he found was that we have this nice, we tended when you plot the models together, you tend to get this nice parabola shape in this space where we've got the QPM misfit here with five as magic number down here uh, against the dipolarity. So how much does the dipole dominate at the core mantle boundary? And where these things dipped uh, to their lowest misfit, so the most realistic models was also around about within areas of where Earth-like models were predicting, uh, of where, sorry, um, uh, descriptive field models were predicting the dipolarity. Uh, to be as well, uh, but a lot of models never really got never got close to this this um, this magic line of, of, of five. Um, and what we actually found was that it, it required then to go to chemical chemically forced models, so models purely driven by the growth of the inner core and the release of light elements there, rather than by thermal convection. Um, 
But once we did that, then we did find some models that did dip in into this area. Um, we didn't find anything that was absolutely perfect with a QPM of five, but we did get to a misfit of about two and a half. Um, so this is our, our model with the lowest misfit and where it falls down um, in terms of failing criteria is that it doesn't reverse quite enough. So you can see it's got nice earth like you know, reversal in there and uh, excursions, but they're just not frequent enough to, uh, to represent you know, the last 10 million years. Okay, now an interesting, we've got a nice dipolar shape and we've got this variability in, in dipole moment that, that appears Earth-like. Uh, now an interesting observation to make from this is that if you take the, this model and you just, ex, you, you change nothing about it apart from the Rayleigh number, you force it a little bit harder, you change the Rayleigh number from 1.6 to 1.8 times 10 to the 7. So that's just sucking the heat out of the core a little bit faster, allowing the inner core to grow a bit faster. And suddenly you've got a completely different model that's now got reversal hyperactivity uh, in there. It's looking a lot less dipolar and it's looking a lot weaker as well. So this is really supporting that you don't need to do much to the geodynamo to make it um, change its behavior quite radically. Um, okay, so we got to, uh, uh, to near enough our, our, our most Earth-like model, um, but that's not to say that all the ones that weren't Earth-like weren't also really useful for us. Um, so one thing that uh, Richard Bono um, worked on was looking at all the, the models and finding that they all contained, um, or a large number of them, contained systematic um, covariance between different spherical harmonic terms within them. So for example, this first, what this first column is showing is that to increase G10, you also tend to increase G30. The axial octopole goes with the axial dipole. Uh, now, the reason this was interesting is because our statistical field models at the moment run something called a giant Gaussian process where all these terms act completely independently of each other. And the dynamo models were saying, well, you know, that's actually not what's happening in, in at least, you know, uh, in these simulations. Uh, so what Richard did then was try to incorporate this, uh, this covariance into a uh, giant Gaussian process model. And what he found was that the resulting uh, um, uh, fit to data improved quite markedly. So what are our measurements telling us? Uh, well, perhaps that the, um, that the Earth also has this covariance between these different terms, and that's telling us something about the structures um, of, of the, that are generating the magnetic field. So another aspect that was really you useful. Up there, Andy, you're you're a good you're you're a few couple of minutes left there. Couple of minutes left. Okay, I'll I'll wrap up. So this is just pointing another paper that's very recently um, accepted, um, which was yeah linking um, the shape of the field to its variability. Um, so what we found was that as you you vary the field, um, as sorry as the field becomes more variable, then you see that it's it becomes less. Uh, dominated by an axial dipole. It looks less like um, um, a bar magnet. And this was really interesting because we don't have any measurements of axial dipole dominance from before um, a few million years ago, whereas we have measurements of paleosecular variation back to billions of years ago. And we've got a nice uh, power law, predictive power law that came out from all our simulations and from field models as well. Uh, so we were able to say something about the um, uh, about how dipole, uh, axial dipole dominance has, uh, has changed through geological history. And uh, the big, um, uh, the key point to emerge from that is not very much. So the field didn't often look like this or like this. In actual fact, it spent most of its time looking like this, which is IGRF, right? Which is today's field. Okay, so that's something else that's told us. So just a quick future application. Um, so just to point out that we've been also been doing a huge amount of work at Liverpool on uh, measuring um, the properties of the, the paleomagnetic field back through geological time. And uh, these yellow points show our efforts at um, uh, increasing the number of, of estimates of, of dipole moment through geological time in the last five years. And uh, what we've outlined are um, yeah, two periods in particular where the field was appears to be radically different in that it was much weaker um, uh, than today. Um, so, you know, the big question of how, how we go forward uh, with, with dynamo models is, can we capture this behavior like we have done for the last 10 million years as well? Okay, and if we can, then knowing how we have to perturb our present day model to, um, to, to simulate a field looking like these, we might be able to say something about how the physical properties of the deep earth have, um, have changed over time. 
Okay, so I'm out of time, so I'll just leave my summary slide up there. Thank you.